Well, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Um, I would love to have a very informal style talk today, so please do ask questions at any time. Um, what I'm going to do is tell you about the Global Burden of Disease Study and tell you really about uh, kind of challenges, problems, puzzles, and not tell you a ton about solutions because we have some solutions, but they're not great solutions. I think it's much more fun to sort of uh, invite you in and get you to solve these problems for me. So as Bava said, um, I am a mathematician by training, and I did my PhD in the Carnegie Mellon Math Department with Alan Fries. And I was in this algorithms, combinatorics, and optimization program. And after I got out and after I did a postdoc, I kind of changed what I was doing and started doing global health metrics research. And I landed right in the middle of this global burden of disease study. And the global burden of disease, for those of you who are not as intimately familiar with it as I have become over those years, is this giant study, and this is the web page about it now on a medical journal called The Lancet, but their old page described it in a little bit more detail. It's a giant systematic effort to describe the global distribution and causes of a bunch of different diseases, injuries, and risk factors. And when I would go back to my math department buddies, and tell them about what I was up to, you know, a lot of times they would just give me the brush off, but if they were really engaging with this idea of measuring the burden of disease, their first question to me would be, what are the units? How do you even quantify disease burden? And the units, at least the way we do it at the IHME, are years. We measure it in years, or disability adjusted life years, DALIs, to make that uh, into an acronym. And DALIs have two parts, years of life lost and years lived with disease. And what this does is puts on equal footing the diseases that kill uh, by you know, reducing people's lives and contributing to burden through years of life lost with the diseases that if you like ill, the diseases that don't necessarily kill but affect a lot of people for a long time like depression and anxiety disorders. And so it's a summary metric that lets you say in this country at this time, here's how bad this was, this disease was, and here's how it compares to this disease in this country at this time. And so what it looks like is this. <laughs> this is called a tree map. It's a glorified pie chart, though. What this is is showing all of the different diseases as we have grouped them, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive list, doctors like to say, or a partition for those of you who do math that um, has a little wedge of pie. I guess it's a glorified pie chart, but it's really more of a sheet cake. So each of these little rectangles has area proportional to how bad the disease it represents is. And it's not just diseases, diseases. It's also in green, including injuries, which are not something doctors would call diseases, but certainly from a public health perspective, something that is reducing health in the world. And this moves. So people were very excited when we took all the time when we gave them this plot, but when they found out it moved, anyway. Is David. Is the DHL relative to the life expectancy in that, in that country? Ah, great question. So the years of life lost have uh, sort of, anyway, I'll get into it in more detail. But the life expectancy in countries is important, but it is also important to have some kind of uh, universal metric around how well um, people can live. How come things are new and they're actually everything? I will get into that too. Great question. Um, first, let me show you how it moves. <laughs> so you, you can find it if you search for GBD compare. We don't have a great uh, search engine optimization of it as yet. But I think if I search for GBD compare, at least today, it's the first thing that comes up. So. That should be enough to get you to it. And now I'm doing something a little dangerous, which is showing you an interactive website over wireless. <laughs> but uh, we'll see how it goes. So there's a tour. This was recently called by Bill Gates an interesting but too complicated website. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, I think the, the best way to make it simpler is to use the advanced settings. <laughs> so you. You've seen this sort of sheet cake map on the right already. If I take the level down 
to one, then it just has three pieces in this cake. In blue is the non-communicable diseases. In red is the infectious diseases, although it's now called just group one because together with the uh, communicable are also maternal, neonatal, and nutritional diseases that are not technically infectious. And in green are the injuries. And even at this level, and even without using all of the different knobs and bells on this, you can see something interesting happen. Because at the beginning of the time period that we're making estimates for, the plurality, if not the majority, of disease burden in the world comes from this communicable wedge. But over the period of time, there's this shift, what public health people are calling the epidemiological transition. And so by the last year that we have estimated, now 2013, the majority of burden has shifted to the non-communicable diseases. And now I'll give you a quick tour of some of the things that you can do to slice and dice this. To explore what's going on here, I can show you also that this global <coughs> picture masks considerable heterogeneity between countries. If we look in the United States, for example, we'll see that we are much on the after side of the epidemiological transition to be compared with, say, somewhere in Central Africa that is very much still on the before side. And even at this level of uh, resolution, there are still surprises. For example, China has an epidemiological profile much more like the United States than like a lot of low-income countries. Um, I could basically play with this for the entire time that you give me and then some. <laughs> so I'm going to try to restrain myself. I want to show you two, I want to show you three more things about it. First of all, I want to drill down back to having different categories and then show you how um, different countries have different major problems popping out and by focusing in on a particular disease, we can see that there are different patterns in different parts of the world. Um, and then I want to change it to show you something about uncertainty, because it already came up, the question, how much do I think I'm right in these different wedges? Well, it, it depends what we're talking about. But I've really gone uh, you know, the distance to try to quantify how little I know. I think is the answer. A lot of times, we don't know very much. But we're going to try to quantify that. And the way I can show you that is, if I remember how, <laughs> I can change it from a map to something that will show me by year what's going on. And so this is going to remove the map. We're on South Africa. I really expected that to show me years. Um, I'm going to learn how to use this again one day. If I had clicked the right three things, it would have gone straight to this. And so each of these points is if you make me give you a single point, that's my best estimate. But the vertical line that goes through it says, but actually, you know, I think I know that to about 20% accuracy. Yeah. And so it really could be a lot more or a lot less. I really wanted to see that over time. And I got it. Good. I'm proud of myself. So there's a lot hidden in here. Um, and one of the things that's hidden that I do want to be sure to show you is hidden here, because I think it's one of the things that people have ended up very interested in, is something about risk factors. So I mentioned diseases and I mentioned injuries. Risk factors, the way my colleagues like to think about it, are not diseases. But they're kind of the things that cause diseases that we can do something about a lot of times. So by clicking on risk, it has now changed the shading in all of these wedges of cake to show how much of that burden can be attributed to specific risks. And in this case, it's saying all risks. But we could focus it you know, just on a uh, uh, bad diet which I think we call nutritional risks. Maybe we just call it diet for the whole category, though. And then it says, OK, you know, the major burden of HIV can't be attributed to any problems with diet, but a lot of the ischemic heart disease and stroke that's going on can. 
so is that something that arises from data or from medical knowledge? It's a very interesting process. And of all the parts that I've shown you, that's the one I'll tell you the least about here. But it, it has to come from some kind of uh, you know, hypothesis that's had some real experiment to confirm that there is a relationship using the kind of medical randomized controlled trial approach if possible. And then it has to come from data to say, well, how much uh, is the population exposed to this risk so that we can apply the uh, relative risks that we think uh, are come from that exposure? I have to check my time because I made it through that in the right amount of time, but there's always the risk that I won't. I encourage you to play around with it more. Sorry, so on that, is it vaguely fair to say that like feature selection comes from hypothesis? Testing, you know, like the construction of medical knowledge and then measurement comes from data? Uh, depending on what you call features. But in the way I'm conceiving of it, it's actually something at a higher level than features that comes from medical knowledge. It's a, more like a map between risk factors and the diseases, so it's a causal map. And that's, that's got to come, someday that's got to come from data. At this point, that's got to come from, you know, doctors scratching their heads and saying, we think smoking causes lung cancer, and then years of fighting about it, and then eventually a consensus emerging that says not just, yes, it's causally linked, but in fact, here's the kind of effect. If you smoke a pack a day, we think that's going to elevate your risk by this amount. Are these percentages a function of absolute numbers, or per, you know, per 100,000 population, or what, what's sort of the base? Ah, so I said DALI, but I didn't dig into it. And there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice that. Everything we've been looking at so far is in rates. And that's because if you put it in absolute numbers, well, it doesn't change the tree map, because that's actually fractions. But it, it changes the map of the world, where you basically see big countries are big. Um, and so there's some need to do more focusing uh, if you want to look in absolute numbers. Sometimes it is also useful to look at percentages. So it all depends what your interest is. Per person year. So yeah, you have to look at how many people there are, and then because people come and go, you want to do something that makes it really into a rate. I can't come here and not say big data. So this guy, Peter Piat, is one of the stars of global health, and he has been in the news a lot recently because he's the first person to have identified Ebola. But he, after that, did a lot of work on HIV. Uh, he, he's a fan, and he says, when I read about big data, and I think this is the right way to talk about big data these days, most of the time it's fairly meaningless, except to people in marketing and advertising. But with the GBD, which is this thing I've been talking about, we're making big data on healthcare accessible, part of it, I realize, is actually we're making big data. That the, the data that goes in is, you know, if it's on a hard drive, it's maybe big variety, but very moderate or even small in size. What comes out is something about a lot of countries and a lot of times, and it's a little bit disturbing how much comes out from the little bit that goes in. But uh, hopefully it is something that really can be useful. Um, so this flow chart, I sometimes joke, is the outline for the rest of the talk. It's not. There's too much in here to fit into a talk. And this is the flow chart for how we made these estimates in the GBD 2010 that's been updated and complicated to the degree that it's not possible to really read on one slide in the GBD 2013 update. Um, but it gives you some idea of what's gone into it. And these boxes I've circled will be the outline for the rest of the talk. <clears throat> so I mentioned I'm, <coughs> I'm not going to have too much to say about the risk factor part. But I will tell you about, as I see it, the other parts that go into making all of those tiles. First of all, the age-specific mortality rates, where we're looking at all-cause mortality. <clears throat> and then how we break that down into the different causes of that mortality, the cause of death work. And then how we look at the non-fatal health outcomes in box seven on disease prevalence. And then how we put those things together, because that's a sort of challenging and controversial part where we have to come up with disability weights to convert between years of life lost and years lived with the disease. And before I dig into that, I want to tell you if especially students want to do more of this, we're hiring. <laughs> and it looks like I don't have a lot of undergraduates in the audience. 
But if there are undergraduates, take note, we have this post-bachelor fellowship program. If there are people who work with undergrads, you can tell them about this. It's a very cool way to really do the work behind a lot of this stuff. And if you like it and hang around for three years, you can have a master's in public health from it. We also have a sort of postdoc program that I did when I was sort of switching into this field, and it's called a postgraduate fellowship. We're also growing a lot, and we're hiring people who are uh, in more senior positions. Enough about that advertising part. Now I'm going to dig in to mortality rates and how we do this age-specific mortality rate estimation, unless there are more questions. So in all of this, I don't have time to tell you the details of how we do it, but we're on the hook for making age and sex-specific mortality estimates for 187 countries over a pretty long time period. And I will dig in a little bit to how we do part of that, which is for a similar time period country list, um, to just say, what is the adult mortality rate? An adult mortality rate, now that's getting into something that will sound more familiar to people who are doing theoretical research. What's the probability that a person who has made it to age 15 dies before age 60? Why do we look at this range? Why do we have an obsession with adult mortality? Well, in part because that's something that we have enough data to get some estimates of, and in part because that's something where we can just say from a normative, you know, sort of outside look, it, it sh we should shoot for zero. There's no reason. No one can live forever. But these are good years that everyone should be able to survive. And um, there's also a reason, based on how this came out of uh, some different international organizations, World Bank thinks this is a good time for people to be working in a global perspective. So it is also of interest uh, <coughs> from an economic lens. And so if you want to know the probability that someone who's made it to age 15 will make it to age 60 uh, in a place like the United States, you can get data off the web that will let you figure it out. You go to the Census Department website, it'll tell you the age-specific populations over time, and that'll give you a denominator. You can go to the National Center for Health Statistics website, they'll tell you how many people are dying. They've got a good stack of death certificates, and that can give you the numerator. And so with nothing much more sophisticated than division, you can really come up with a curve that I think you know, has interesting stories about public health that shows the adult mortality rate in the United States in 1970 was around 240, around a quarter of 15-year-olds uh, would not make it to age 60 in the world as it was in 1970. And that has gone down, 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 down over time until in 2010, it is about half of that. It is now around 130. Military deaths are an interesting challenge, and I'm surprised that you caught me in that one right now. But no, it misses foreign military deaths overseas, which go from the Department of Defense to states bypassing the National Center for Health Statistics. Um, and I have to fix that. And they said, we're happy to give you the data, but you just file a FOIA, and we give it to you that way. We don't give anything out unless the judge says we have to. Um, now, hidden in this curve also is something for anyone who has to teach calculus when someone says, what do we use derivatives for? Because there's a slope from 1970 to 1980 that is much steeper than the slope from 1980 to mid-90s. And it's going down across that whole period, but there's two distinct slopes down. And in the mid-90s, there's this big correction to that, which makes me think I could tell you just from this exactly what the story is. This is the AIDS epidemic in the United States. And this is a major cause of adult mortality that showed up in the early 80s, and then effective treatments came online in the mid-90s, kind of dropping for all of that delay and decline over the 80s and 90s. Of course, the direct route uh, I'm very certain about this, and thanks for asking, because that's a perfect segue. 
If I wasn't certain about it, I would show a big gray ribbon around that black line. And this is the case in Paraguay, where you can still go online, and the WHO has a collection of death certificates that Paraguay has given them, and there's a few different sources where you can get populations from Paraguay for that denominator. But my colleagues who really scrutinize this stuff say they can't have everything. Paraguay is missing some of the deaths. And we know that by comparing two data sources against each other. If we look at how many deaths there are every year from death certificates, but then we look at a census and say how many people are there when they do the census, how many people are there when they do the next census, they don't add up. So we think that the death certificates are not covering everybody in Paraguay. We think they're covering pretty much everybody in the United States. My neighbor is the death uh, epidemiologist for the state of Washington. She, she confided in me last year, we missed two deaths last year. I can't believe we missed two. You know, I can't believe you're looking in that level of detail, and I'm really sorry, but uh, you added them in, right? But in Paraguay, they missed probably 20% or something. So vastly different levels of accuracy in the different areas. Um, and I put this up in part just to say, so you know, here's a challenge. When you get out of the United States system where you have all this complete information, there's nice puzzles to be solved and nice challenges to say, how do we stitch together? the information that's available and figure out how right and how wrong it is and quantify our uncertainty in that. There's also a public health story that's of interest here, and I guess I've been hanging around the public health people too much because I can't help telling them, but do you remember where the curve started for the United States in 1970? It was at 240. It was way higher than the adult mortality rates in Paraguay at the same time. And in fact, if we flip back and forth between them, it's not until the mid-90s when the effective treatments for HIV came online and there was that big jump that the United States crossed over and overtook Paraguay in terms of adult mortality. That's weird. Automobile accidents? For what was causing the uh, high? Why the US is high. US, automobiles are probably part of it. Smoking is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. Because they, you know, think that they're slightly, so that you're missing people it's way more likely than. Yeah. So the precise details of how we're estimating the uncertainty, I'm not going to give you, but you can see a little hollow triangle at the bottom there that we've said that's just got to be wrong. So there's part of it that includes like a very careful scrutiny, saying, look, there's some things that are outliers. Something totally unexplainable happened that year. They actually didn't report what happened the next year, so it's probably like something about the system. Then you can see little wiggles in there that I'm not chasing. So that's some of what goes into the uncertainty that I say, I don't think in that mid 80s it really dropped like that. Yeah, but still, right? I mean, no, if I knew, well, I don't know about Gaussian processes, I would have expected a much larger bound <clears throat> near, I don't know, 1993 or so, right? Because there's a gap. Well, that's because it's not going for that one. He's ignoring Yeah, that so I've, I've said no, that No, no, one. even if you ignore that point. Oh, yeah. Because, because of the way it's because turned down. Because there's information on during that time, I would expect larger variants. Mm. Mm. I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Fine. No one's caught me on that one before. I got to think about that. Um, but yeah, you see at the end, when I'm projecting forwards beyond where the data is, it blows up and it says, okay, at the end, I don't know what happened. And it's got data on both sides, so it shouldn't blow up as much as when it's one-sided, but yeah, why wouldn't it balloon out a little bit in the middle there? And just to be sure that this is what I think it is, so you said the 1970 point is if I'm age 15 in 1970, so you're using 45 years of data to generate that point. Now that's a demographer's sleight of hand. And they really mean what they call period mortality. Not cohort mortality, meaning following people for 45 years, but period mortality, the way I interpret it, meaning freeze the world with 1970 conditions. And if you had a synthetic cohort that lived through the mortality rates observed in 1970, this is the probability they would have. So you're never supposed to check me on these numbers. It's not a prediction. It's Demographers like it because it's something they can calculate this year and compare across place. Um, 
And to return to some of these questions about where does the uncertainty come from, what if I don't have data from a vital uh, registration system, even like if it's incomplete, like in Paraguay? Well, Iraq is one of these places where there's a few times in the late 70s where there was a report on the vital registration system. But for the most part, no, not data on uh, death certificates going from Iraq to the uh, WHO's repository. And yet we're still on the hook for making these comparable estimates everywhere. And at the very least, we need to be able to say, what does mortality look like in Iraq compared to other countries over this time period? So huge uncertainty, and some of this has to be based just on, we don't know, but we know there was a war. But some of it is based in those uh, brown squares on what's called sibling history surveys. Fascinating area. Again, one that I want to put out there as something interesting with maybe the most connection to the network stuff that I did before I started doing health metrics, where you do sort of social surveying. You find somebody who's willing to sit down and answer your questions, and one of the questions you ask is how many brothers and sisters do you have? Have you, did you have? And then the next question is how many are still alive? And then for the ones that died, you ask some questions about when they died and the conditions of it. And from that, you try to back out the adult mortality rates. There's a huge problem. Even if you've done a nice job selecting the respondents for your survey, there's this important systematic bias in the answers they're giving you. Because the bigger families are, the more siblings there are, to be around to answer the questions about how their siblings are doing. And there's a great, you know, one of the real math things in this demography stuff I've come up to is if you assume that uh, mortality rates are independent of family size, there's a miracle of cancellation. You can just do a simple calculation and get an uh, unbiased estimate. Are these things independent? No way. I mean, in a lot of places, Having a big family is related to having higher socioeconomic position, and so having less mortality. Uh, and so it's going to be very biased if you assume things that way. And that's in a global perspective. Also in a lot of places, like the United States, having a small family has something to do with high socioeconomic position. So you can't even sort it out by saying, and I know where the bias is going to be. Um, this slide also shows the limits of this kind of stuff. You see that my data, in this case, the um, squares with outlines means that it's during war. So we use that data. The triangle, I, I'm not actually sure why it's outlined. I thought that meant we didn't use it, but then it's changed the envelope in a way that i am got to check into. But the point is, we had to make predictions out to 2010 when we knew that there was a lot of stuff going on and we didn't have anything to say about it. And we did the best we could. But when we went back and got more data, we saw we were way off. And so a subsequent data gathering effort said, you know what, you have limits to what you can say with this stuff. And so even if you've drawn a nice gray ribbon around that black line, uh, you must interpret that with caution as well. And that is all I'm going to say about measuring all-cause mortality. And this slide doesn't have anything to do with my talk. It's just that for people who don't think about death and disease all the time, I feel like it can be kind of a bummer to have got to this point of the talk. And so if you're feeling bad about me talking about all the different ways people die, um, remember also puppies. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, as far as you know, the data that we have available and the work that we have to do in the global burden of disease was the easy part. And that's kind of like the, the necessary first step to say just how many deaths are there, because the next step is to parcel it out into different causes. And that's really getting towards what we can say we're going to try to do something about. So like I told that story about uh, what's going on in the uh, United States as the total as the adult mortality rate greatly declined, now we're going to try to really dig in and figure out what the drivers were. The standard way for demographers to deal with migration is to assume there's no migration. <laughs> Does that bother you? <laughs> it, it's got to be wrong. It's got to be a huge problem. And so there are people who look very specifically at migration, at migrant health. There's a lot of interesting things that you find out, like 
people who are coming from Latin America to the United States are shockingly healthy. And then there's questions of, well, some of that is real health, some of that is this kind of bias introduced by who is it who travels for uh, economic migration. Um, some of it is something about different ways that the data is collected, like people who get sick might want to go home to a place where they're comfortable to spend their final days. Um, but comprehensively at a global level, there's a lot of room for improvement for looking at migration. And so there's some effort now from the people doing this to start measuring how much flow in and flow out there is and account for that. I don't think anyone is really seriously working on the networks at this point, especially globally. And you know, it's a huge problem to have data on what's going on with that, but also there's a lot of opportunity from kind of uh, indirect sources to at least start chiseling away at it. But I'm going to dig into the causes and leave all of the problems with the all-cause mortality for another day. So if you want to find out what people are dying of, the best thing you can have is a death certificate. And when I give this talk, I often like to check now if there's anyone in the audience who fills out death certificates. I give a talk with a doctor audience, and a lot of times people say, you know what, I do fill those out. If you have friends who fill out death certificates, what I want you to tell them, and this is what surprises the doctors when they're in the audience, is that someone looks at these. They think they just fill them out because like, someone required them to fill it out and they should get rid of it. But actually, we look at them. And actually, we try to interpret what they've written on them. So please, you know, put in a little bit of effort to try to do it. I know it's hard, but it's going to get used and it's actually going to shape our understanding of what people are dying of. And it's hard to do. Doctors hate filling this out, in part because they would much rather be helping someone who is ill than kind of reflecting on someone who has recently died. But also, it's uh, just one of these things that it's not clear that it's being used ever. So a really well-filled out death certificate might look like this. And it might say on the top line, the uh, condition that was directly leading to death, pulmonary embolism, and then work its way through a causal pathway that says that embolism was caused by a fractured femur, and that was caused by a bone cancer, but that was a secondary cancer. That was caused by a breast cancer. And then in the second half, part two of the death certificate, it might say additional contributing causes. Um, and what I'm looking for, what my public health buddies are into, is a single underlying cause, because they have this idea that <laughs> a similar assumption to assuming there's no migration. They have this idea that a single death has a single cause. And they're going to try to find out what it is. Is this, the, is this a universal form, or is this, I mean, or rather, are there separate medical and, shall we say, probate death certificates? Or? Well, it's a great question. I've seen death certificates, and, what and they this tend not is, to be this detailed. This is <laughs> what the WHO suggests for the medical certificate. And then what every country does is changes this somehow and sticks it in with a bunch of other stuff that they want. So if you've seen a death certificate in the United States, actually those vary by state. The, the uh, national uh, group from NIH and CDC puts together a kind of proposed, here's what the WHO said and here's how we think it should be changed. And then every state takes that and changes it their own way. And then that's the one that uh, would actually come uh, in the case of a death in the United States. And for example, this thing about the interval between the time of deaths, which I think would be hugely useful for checking if there are errors in these things, I've never seen that included on one of the certificates that is actually in use. Um, and fortunately, the WHO has done some effort in kind of bringing back together the information that's common between these things so that for researchers who want to get into it, there's an easy place to start. But that effort has meant removing all of the information about the causal pathway and not having anything about the years and having a very limited sort of here's what we think the underlying cause is kind of data. Coded in one of about 10 different coding schemes. Um, but we don't need to get into that part now. It's just fun quirks of really working with data. What is it? Some, I 
somehow did all this deductive research when I was in grad school and then realized I love working with data and then start talking about data in front of an audience and say, how, what is it that I loved about this? But, uh, you know, it's, it's got all these tough little puzzles, I guess. It can be very annoying also. Um, so the problem with these death certificates is that if you try to read off the cause of death from the bottom line of the death certificate, it often doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense from like a doctor's causal pathway. And it doesn't make sense for public health reasons, because sometimes it just says, you know, uh, natural causes. Um, and so a big part of using this data is dealing with what my colleagues call the garbage codes that are on the death certificates. And I'm not going to tell you how to solve that problem. I'm going to tell you it's a big problem. This is a percent of garbage that comes from mapping the death certificates by country. You can see that in a few places, like in Northern Europe, there's a lowest levels of garbage, around 10%. But in a lot of parts of the world, there's more than 50 or 60% of the death certificates that just have some not useful information, what you might call, if you were not feeling charitable, garbage data. And so I think, you know, if you like a kind of algorithmic lens view of this challenge, doctors are noise machines. And they're somehow <laughs> taking the information about the world and noising it up. And the goal is to recover what really happened from the kind of garbagey data that we are getting. Although there's another big problem, and I'm going to transition to that, that is hidden on this map, which is all of the countries that don't have a color. And this map shows in red all of the places where you can't go to the WHO website and get information on what's going on in their vital registration system, garbagey though it is. What do you do if you're trying to figure out what people are dying of in sub-Saharan Africa? Especially if the Gates Foundation is paying for this research and is particularly interested in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, kind of the best game in town is to go ask. And what it's called is a verbal autopsy. And the way it works is uh, someone goes out and finds uh, someone to survey. Someone, an uh, interviewer, finds a respondent who has familiarity with the deceased and asks a bunch of questions about the signs and symptoms in that illness. Did Blank have a fever during her last illness? And was that fever continuous or on and off? Or, or maybe just tell me in your own words what happened in the events that led up to the death. And the tradition has been to take data sets like this, give them to doctors. The doctors didn't even like filling out death certificates when it was their patient. Now it's someone who they have no familiarity with and haven't even seen in person. Oh, and it has to be a doctor who has some experience in the area that you're trying to study. Because if you find a doctor in Boston, they might not know what's going on in sub-Saharan African uh, health. And so some, someone who has experience in this very resource-limited area where they, for a number of reasons now, don't want to be spending their time coding these things. And so this is a good opportunity for some sort of machine learning methods, which is the area that I've been working on in this the most, to say, look, let's take doctors out of this and have computers do as well as we can. And uh, in fact, there's a lot of gains just to be made by saying, let's do electronic data capture and have actually uh, this very complicated set of questions be recorded immediately as the interview is happening. Um, and then, once it's electronically captured, we can run it through machine learning methods. And this is kind of my brag slide about how well I can do in the machine learning methods, where we're really interested in how well we can predict at the population level what people are dying of, which makes it kind of interesting methodologically, because then we have to be sure that we're testing things in a fair way for this population level prediction. But we'll also look at how well we're doing on an individual level prediction. And at the individual level prediction, my method that I work so hard on is not great, right? About 50 or 60% of the time. Well, that's great. I work really hard to get it to that point, and it's better than anything else that's out there. But I guess the savvy public health officials say, so it's wrong 40 or 50% of the time. Well, yes, it's very hard to tell what people are dying of from a set of signs and symptoms. And that's why doctors don't like doing it also. And by the way, death certificates are not perfect at this either. 
they're certainly better than a verbal autopsy, and I would recommend them to any national ministry of health that's considering whether to use them or not. But they are not perfect either. So there's a lot of opportunity for doing it better with the data we have, for improving the data we're collecting, or even for improving what we consider the best way to do it now. How do you, how do you get ground truth, like from a death certificate? For this, we got like $15 million from the Gates Foundation to make a validation data set. And so doctors sat around in a room and they said, okay, if it meets this and this and this, then we're sure it's a heart attack. Um, and there's you know, a bunch of published things that uh, say what all those criteria are for what conditions there are. And then we got about 15,000 examples from five sites around the world. That's all publicly available. So if you want to dig into this, you can get ground truth now. Thank you, Gates Foundation. In the U.S. Um, and possibly other places, do liability concerns for doctors change what they might put on death certificates? Absolutely. And so there's uh, certainly like uh, anecdotes that are abound in this field that say things like, no coroner is going to write something was a suicide unless there was a note that says, uh, I'm done. You know, if there's any way to say, oh, it was an accidental poisoning, it's going to be coded that way. Or globally, there's been a lot of stigma around AIDS deaths. So if there's any way to say that this was a pneumonia that caused the death or this was anything other than an AIDS death, then the doctors are going to certify it in that way. On the other hand, there's also a lot of interest in getting these things right. So in the United States, there's something called the National Death Followback Survey, where they take a sample of deaths and then do something very similar to a verbal autopsy where they find someone with familiarity with the death and ask them a bunch of questions to see if it checks out. We haven't done that in like 20 years, though, so we should do it again. But uh, yeah, yeah, a lot to be said about that stuff. But instead, I'm going to transition to a different part of the Global Burden of Disease study. Um, so that is as much as I'm going to say about parsing out causes of death, although I'm way open to more questions about it. And you've been great for asking questions so far, so keep it up. Uh, without more, I'm going to transition now to saying what is the prevalence of disease? And this is the part that I ended up working the most on. And it ended up being a gigantic systematic review exercise. So for all of the diseases on the list of diseases, there was sort of a special interest group. You know, some people who were very interested in anxiety disorders, for example, who came together to say, this is the entire published and unpublished literature on anxiety disorders. I've never seen their flowcharts made in a way that's aesthetically pleasing. At least this one has readable fonts. But what it shows is typical for this kind of systematic review work. The people who really want to say how bad anxiety disorders are made a search that came up with about 16,000 articles that could have something to do with the population level, uh, prevalence, incidence, et cetera, about anxiety disorders. And then from those, they screened out all of the ones that were like a case study, or even though it said anxiety disorder in the abstract, it wasn't about anxiety disorder, or it was a secondary analysis from some previous group that was doing a meta-analysis. And then <laughs> from the 6,000 that were left, they had to read them in more detail. And most of the time said, OK, now that we've looked at it more carefully, we realize we should have thrown that one out in the first time. And at the end of the day, they can say, OK, we've got the 89 studies that we have found ever that have quantified the level of anxiety disorder in a population somewhere. And the three studies ever that cal uh, did the same thing for the incidence of anxiety disorders. And um, what I got to do when I showed up first doing this was stitch this all together somehow. And so in a picture, they came in with a data set that looks like this. <laughs> and this, what this shows on the x-axis is the age group, because age is often one of the most important uh, determinants of disease prevalence. And on the y-axis, the prevalence level that was measured. And so this big bar that you can see, because it's at the top, shows in a study of basically unrestricted ages, 15 to 94-year-olds, there was a measured value of 30% prevalence. So this was a very unusual, it was actually a post-war, post-conflict setting where there was a very high level of anxiety. And they quantified the uncertainty because they did a good job doing this study. And 
there's a whole mess of similar and very inconsistent data on disease prevalence underneath there. So they said, before I knew any better, why don't you figure out a way to stitch this all together? And, oh, and it's not always going to be easy like this one. You know, sometimes we'll have data on prevalence and also data on incidence and mortality risk. And these are all connected in some way because the prevalent cases now either were prevalent cases last year or else there was some incident event. And then in a case like dementia where there's no remission, they stay incident until, or stay prevalent until death. Or in a slightly more complicated case, maybe there's also some remission, diseases are being cured, et cetera. And so the, the job in this case is to take all of this data and somehow <laughs> draw lines like we had before where there's a thick line that's my best estimate if you pin me down and make me give you one, and also some ribbon around it where I say, and here's the kind of range of values that it could be. Um, and, and do it in a way that's consistent so that incident cases minus uh, deaths minus remissions uh, add up to the, the prevalence as it's changing over time. And I'm not going to go through a great amount of detail of how I've done this, but I think it's a generally useful way that brings together a model of process and a model of data. And this is something that my colleagues in pharmacokinetics were doing, and they called it integrative systems modeling. So I kind of like that name, and I'm sticking with it. In this case, it's got a compartmental model of disease progression and a bunch of nice stuff added on top of that. It's got a negative binomial model for the disease rates that we're pulling out of the literature, and a bunch of uh, bells and whistles added up on top of that. And because no one could understand what I was talking about when I did even a whole hour talk on it, let alone a little segment talk on it, there is now a book about it that says, you know, like it or not, here's all the details of how we're putting all of this stuff together. And I think if you order it on Amazon, I think it will actually show up now. This book actually exists. I've held it. But uh, last time I looked at Amazon, it said, like, taking pre-orders. So I'm not sure if they're really ready to send it out. Um, Anyway, I don't have enough time, even if I devoted entirely to tell you how I did it, but it's also one of these things where like, I'm very open to new ideas. If I had a chance to start over again on it, maybe I would go about it very differently than I did it this time, so I won't poison you with the bad ideas now anyway. What I will do is show you a simple case to show you the kind of challenge that we're dealing with in it. And I think I'm doing just great for time, so feel free to ask any questions as I go. Um, but say we wanted to know not all of these details about age, sex, geography, et cetera, just what's the smoking prevalence? How many adults are smoking in the United States? In 2010, and actually every year uh, since then and for many years before then, <coughs> there was a great survey called the Behavioral Risk Factors Surveillance System that is a phone survey that gets about half a million people a year and says all these questions about uh, health risks, but among other things, says, Do you, are you a daily smoker? And from this great, gigantic, well-conducted phone survey, they can say very precisely there's about 17% of the population that smokes. And this is a, a funny style that I've used to draw it. The square is just a visual mark of how many people uh, answered the survey, but the width of that vertical, of that bar, shows you the uncertainty interval. And the only problem with doing all of this work is that we're doing it in a bunch of different ways. And so there's a slightly smaller annual survey that was also done in 2010 that's um, the Tobacco Use Survey, which is paid for by the National Cancer Institute but run by the census. And they also asked hundreds of thousands of people a basically identical question and got a bit lower estimate of the prevalence. And they have a slightly wider uncertainty interval because they have a smaller sample size. But there's nowhere near overlap between these uncertainty intervals. And all told, there are five big nationally representative surveys, the smallest one doing just thousands, not tens or hundreds of thousands of people, that span the range from about 15% prevalence to 25% prevalence. So a very naughty thing to do would be pick and choose between them especially different ones in different years, to try to say how well or how badly things were going. And a reasonable thing to do, but something that would be a big mistake, would be to use the kind of meta-analysis 
that comes out of a biostats textbook where you say, we're going to pool all of these measurements and use inverse variance weighting, and we'll come up with a very precise estimate that's pretty close to where the biggest measurement was, but is really sure that it doesn't overlap in its uncertainty with any of the measurements that we've made. <laughs> and so that, I think, is unreasonable. And I think what we need to do is something that in meta-analysis is called random effect meta-analysis, where it says, I've got bad news. You spent all of this money doing all of these different surveys, and we're actually less certain based on it than we would have been if you had just done the one. It's probably good that you did them all, but it's not going to make you happy about the way you've spent your money. And the answer is probably somewhere in the middle, around 20% prevalence, but could be higher, could be lower. Everything that you get is just you know, uh, average standard deviation information. You don't get to. I mean, in this case, there's a lot of microdata available. So if you really care about smoking, you can really dig I mean, in. I'm thinking, I mean, maybe the Gaussian assumption may not be the right way to model this. Right. In, and, so and in the in the yeah in the long tail of this stuff, you generally get just the mean and the standard error um, for a bunch of sliced and diced a bunch of different ways. You know maybe by age group by five year age groups or maybe something. A bootstrap type of growth can actually be a better indicator than mean and variance in this case. Um, because of the no yeah just, just yeah major yeah point. absolutely and the 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 challenge. <laughs> is then also to be able to integrate different types of data. Right. So um, you know, it's very appealing to try to do some kind of model-free approach. But then how are you going to incorporate the knowledge that incidence leads to prevalence? Any other questions about that? Well, if not, I'm going to tell you about what I think is one of the most controversial parts of all of this, and that is the disability weights. Because I have told you now something about how we find out how many people are dying, how we find out how many people are ill, and I told you at the very beginning we're going to put that together into a summary metric. And to do that, what we need is the disability weight that says if this many people have this disease, how do we convert that and put it on equal footing with this many years of life lost due to premature death. The way it was done in the first iteration of this, which I'll call GBD-96, was challenged for a number of reasons. But one of them was because it was kind of a consensus process. They got some doctors around a table, and they said, OK, here's something bad that happens because of disease, a kind of rash on the face. How bad is that? Point to where on the ruler you think it lies. And here's something called you know, having your leg amputated below the knee. How bad is that? And an active psychosis, well, the doctors around the table said that this is kind of the worst thing out there, and it's going to be on the higher end of the spectrum. And there's a very specific reason that we want disability weights. We're going to use them specifically for making these burden of disease estimates. But the name that it's given, the disability weight, makes it sound much more universal than it is. So in part because it was doctors around a table, and in part because of the way it sounds based on the name, this is something that we really wanted to do carefully when we were redoing this in the GBD 2010. And the way it was done was similar to a website called Kitten War, <laughs> um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But in Kitten War, uh, the goal is to find the cutest kittens. And the way to find cute kittens is through pairwise comparisons. <laughs> and it, it might be very hard in absolute terms to say, where does this kitten land on this ruler? But it's actually not hard. And I think, in fact, there might be broad agreement if we were to look around the room, which kitten you would click on presented with these pictures. The disability weights took a very <coughs> similar approach, which I characterize as a would you rather questions, pairwise comparisons, converted to disability weights. They weren't really would you rather questions. They really would say there are two people, and they are both have the same amount of time to live, and these are their health impairments. The first person has severe throbbing head pain. The second person uses an addictive substance daily, has difficulty going without. Who do you think is healthier overall? These are questions to doctors? 
These are questions that were fielded in a broad survey. It was actually a uh, Harvard professor named Josh Solomon who led up this part of the project. He found out if it was a doctor or it was someone who didn't have a healthcare uh, job. Okay. And then uh, there were a bunch of in-person surveys so he could find out what was going on in different parts of the world, as well as telephone survey in the United States and just an open survey on the web <coughs> that happened to be translated into Chinese so that he could hope to get some uh, broader global perspective on it. And from this, he can't get the numbers he wants. He can get, this is great computer science kind of thing, an ordering of how bad all of these things are. Sure, it's like a noisy sort of sort sorting process. But there's one more question at the end, and this is really what the numbers are about. Health benefits produced by two different programs. So there's two programs you could choose between them. The first one is going to prevent death in 1,000 people. The second one is going to prevent illness in this many people, and these are the specific details of the illness. Which one produces greater uh, population health benefit? And so this is the what disability weights answer. And anything else, you know, it's a generalization from there, and it's the leap of the generalizer to say it's acceptable to use that disability weight in that other place. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. This uh, gets to the question of where and how these things were asked. Um, and you can see that we asked a lot of people. This is kind of like Josh worked hard is the point of this slide. Um, and based on this question of lots of people, uh, this shows the empirically, this empirically derived disability weight distribution. That is a tongue twister. Um, what you see is there are a few things that were judged very, very bad. And there are a lot of things that were judged, eh, you know, bad but not so bad. But the power of this DALI approach is that if there's something that's not so bad, but a lot of people have it for a long time, that can add up to being a major health problem. Maybe one that would be overlooked if we were just looking at what people were dying of. And this is one of the slides that I love from that work that compares on the x-axis what doctors thought to on the y-axis what people thought when they were surveyed. Can you account for the, the length of time that people have the condition that seems not so bad presumably went into people's thinking about how bad it was to have that condition? Yeah, I made, I made some doctors take this survey, and they hated doing it because they could not get over the way they know disease progresses there are implications for this. So the question as asked says the same amount of time. And the, the philosophical construct says these are for the same amount of time. It doesn't matter how long. The question asks is like, has itchiness for a year or something like that? And it, you know, for, for the same amount of time. So it's just paired itchiness for a year versus uh, addicted to a substance for that same amount of time. But, but doctors, you know, reading those questions, the ones I watched do it, would say, I know what this is, and that guy's in trouble. <laughs> you know, like, no, doctor, please just try to withhold that thought and just answer it based on. So, um, this slide shows some interesting differences between when doctors did it directly and when it went to the whole population, which went in all different directions. You know, it's certainly associated. If you're in the social sciences, you're very happy to see this kind of correlation. Um, and some things like acute schizophrenia ended up with very similar high disability weights. But there are things like blindness, where doctors said, this is really bad. But in pairwise comparisons, the general population said, it's bad, but you know, it's not the worst. Uh, and conversely, migraines, which doctors said, no big deal. Yeah. But, and I love telling this because there's always people nodding in the audience. Because this is actually a pretty common condition. So I can be pretty sure that you know, someone in the audience knows someone who really has dealt with migraines. People hear the sequela, the description of this condition, and they said, that sounds bad. It's kind of weird because right, doctors have a different rate of migraine right, than the regular population, right? So what's the answer? That they can medicate themselves? <laughs> Nobody knows what to do about it. Yeah, no, it's a small group of people. It's a, the pitfalls of having a small group of people use a consensus decision-making process for these things that 
you know, we should be checking out what's going on with the whole population. Um, Sorry, do you think this is caused by familiarity with these diseases? So uh, just <coughs> people who know people with migraines will consider them to be worse in this ordering, and the people are less likely to know somebody who's blind, maybe, and so that's a... <sighs> I'm sure that there's some of that, and I'm sure that there's some, uh, you know, sort of social aspects as well that are not formally part of functional health. So that's the, the challenge in these questions, and you saw a few of the questions, is to write a, what they call a lay description, something where you don't need precise knowledge, medical knowledge, to interpret it, and you don't necessarily even know what the disease is, you just hear about the sequela, about the bad things caused by the disease, and are able to judge. But it's very hard to get right, and very small changes to the wording, you know, there's a whole sort of psychological theory to writing good questions in this way, can make a big difference in how it's rated. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a big survey, and you could consider really asking about people's familiarity with these different diseases in it. Um, I think that asking whether they work in healthcare or not is a proxy for that to some degree. So right, there's already they, some information for it. Because they don't say migraine, they say, you know, headache with nausea and stuff exactly, like that. Exactly, exactly. So it was never called migraine, but you, you could still imagine someone saying, that's exactly how I feel and it's terrible. Or, or whatever, you know, if it's blindness that someone could say, I know what you're talking about here. But, um, but in the addiction ones, Josh also wrote an addiction version that was actually caffeine withdrawal to check on the stigma part of it. And it was uh, showed that sort of the stigma of illicit drug use was a big part of the way people were saying that's a problem versus the functional health part. Um, are there any like high level conclusions from uh, the general study that would sort of change directions if I use the x versus the y axis to measure? Mm, good question. Um, and there were a lot of changes simultaneously. So we got the most data ever, mm -hmm. and we changed actually the construct that we were using for DALIs to make it basically to make it simpler so it would seem less uh, mystifying. And so uh, it's hard to parse out what the changes are between the previous study and the new study. But there certainly have been surprises in all of this. Um, one of the big surprises the first time around was how bad mental disorders are compared to the things that had been the traditional focus of global health, like uh, maternal and child uh, conditions. And that has stayed true. Mental disorders, substance use disorders, are still major sources <coughs> of burden compared in this way. Um, something new in this study was musculoskeletal disorders like back and neck pain. And Done this way, there's now there's no comparator because it wasn't done that way before, but I think that those really jumped out as a major cause of burden that people weren't expecting. And so it was one of those things where we said, what did we do wrong here? You know, is something in our calculation gone wrong or is this really a major cause of burden that we have overlooked till now? It seems like it is a major cause of burden. Like I kind of hurt my neck when we were working on this and laid on my couch for a week and said, you know, I can understand this now, but <laughs> we got to check this out. Um, so what I will tell you about, just to close up, is some of the what comes next. Those are all of the uh, big stories that I have to tell, but as far as what comes next, Gates Foundation, which was the main funder for doing this, liked it. They said, you got to do it. You got to do regular updates. You should do them quarterly. Well, we've backed it off to every two years, but we have wow. <coughs> in three years done our first two-year update. And so if we can just get that down to two years or less, we're really smooth and are able to do updates. And GVD 2015 will be the next update. Um, there's this mission creep part of doing regular updates. So it's great because if we get more data or if we realize there's a better method, we have a way to incorporate it. But it's bad because then people can say, you know, going country by country is great. Originally, it was supposed to just be by 21 regions, agglomerations of countries. And we said, we're going to try to go for countries. Really big hit to do countries. But you know, there are states in India that are bigger than most countries. So there's just this announcement that, oh, next time we're going to do states in India. And we're going to go subnational uh, in certain countries as uh, we can. 
Uh, and then there's a very exciting uh, sort of economic part that I haven't touched on at all that's being added onto this. Um, and actually, I've got a few slides to go with these bullets, so I'll just show you. Uh, if you look at life expectancy for the United States, that comes out of that uh, mortality stuff I showed you at the beginning. But if you look county by county at life expectancy, you can see that the life expectancy for the country masks huge variation between counties. And in fact, there's as much variation between counties in the United States as there are between countries, almost as much as there are between countries in the world. Again, assuming no migration. A and that <laughs> assumption is becoming more and more questionable as now they've said, you know what, let's do life expectancy just within King County, where uh, University of Washington is in Seattle. Do people not migrate between census tracts in, within a city? But you know, it's just one little, just one little wrinkle, an additional wrinkle that we have to solve at some point. Huge variation. I think that's why Arizona and South Florida live so long. Well, you should, you should see when you go to the university district in Seattle. Very <laughs> healthy place. But uh, yeah, so there's uh, certainly room to improve in these subnational estimates. Um, the economic part. So this is the first slide I think I've put in here that puts any kind of dollars in it. There's a huge amount of money that's going into health in various ways. And this shows health spending per capita as tallied by World Bank on the x-axis. And then the health adjusted life expectancy. So that's a single number summary of that DALI stuff that I was talking about that says for a country like the United States, what is the years of healthy life that someone can expect there? And and the United States, labeled here, is a bit of an outlier because we pay the most and we're kind of at the bottom of that cloud of uh, high income countries. It would be much nicer if we could be more like CHE, Switzerland. JPN is Japan, GBR is Great Britain. But there's a lot of different ways to do things here. And so, just looking at dollars and looking at dallies, I mean, this doesn't tell you what to do. It tells you a lot of different possibilities that there are out there. Why not get bad health similar to Great Britain at a much lower cost? Or good health similar to Switzerland if we're going to pay this much? Or Japan is up there because it uh, seems like a really nice combination of health at the very top and cost much more towards the middle. Um, but beyond that very high level stuff, we're also trying to parse things really out into the different causes of disease and the spending on those things, which again is not prescriptive. This is just saying that's what's out there, start a conversation. This is in the United States, and this is very preliminary, but ischemic heart disease, which is around 10% of burden, is around 10% of spending. That seems well matched. COPD chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is around 5% of burden, is much lower, around 2% of spending. And so I don't have a story for why, and I don't even have a value judgment of whether this is right or wrong, but that's interesting. You know, Someone should figure out if that's just because of the way things are grouped on both sides of this plot. Is it just because of the these are usually, I don't know, just that we don't have things to spend on? Yeah, maybe it's cheap. Well, I mean, the, the goal is to have both of these things low, of course. But um, wherever there's a mismatch, I think it's an interesting question. That's, a, that's the start of uh, investigation. Why is that mismatch? And then, and this was the last bullet, now that we have, I mean, sort of been predicting the future to say what's going on in 2013, which it's not the future, but if we haven't measured anything there for 10 years, it's kind of predicting the future. No reason we couldn't have done it 10 years ago. To say, OK, now we really want to project out into the, the 2050, 2060 kind of future. And that's going to be some real useful information for planning. Um, and so that's uh, beginning of efforts to do this. This one's showing 
for congenital heart disease in the United States where there have been huge improvements in surgery, we can say, well, the children who have had their lives saved through the surgery are going to be becoming adults. And so they're, even with the limited information available, maybe is enough to say we have a pretty good picture of what might be happening uh, as time goes forward. So I will leave it there, and I would definitely love to have questions. And if you want more, I got my friend to write a book about my boss. And I thought that was a risky move, but it seems to have gone over well. And Paul Farmer really liked it. So this is one way to get more without having to come uh, to Seattle to read his book. So, I mean, I have, so, so it seems like once you take, for instance, in the case of the weights, once you take the equation, you're running with that in some sense, right? You say, assume this is true, and then use them in this formula. So this, I mean, but these are essentially noisy measurements from noisy measurements from noisy measurements, right? Which weights? Which weights? The disability uh, weights? Disability weights. Yeah. Right? I mean, there seems to be this chain of errors Right, creeping up, but there's no, no, it's not shown in the last value, right? It's, there's a lot of surprises in this sort of propagating uncertainty because sometimes they wash out, right? So if I have a lot of errors county by county, but, but they're unbiased, then the national one could be much more precise. And so the, the basic approach, this is like the, the most methodological thing I'm going to say in this talk, <laughs> is we take draws from posterior distributions. Right. And so we have a 1,000 draws, and they should have the correlations from what predictions were there. And that's what you're using? And yeah, we try to propagate that through. Okay, so that makes sense. But a lot of times, we'll split things up in an analysis. You know? So we'll do a, this is how many heart attack deaths we think there are. Totally separately, this is how many stroke deaths we think there are. and then. Maybe they get put together at some point and have some uh, notion of the, the joint distribution. But at a lot of points, they're independent. And so there's a lot of risk of things washing out that shouldn't be. So um, towards like the labeling of death causes, for, um, so there are a lot of uh, science you know, t documents that you want to transcribe in some way, and one particular you know, way that people solve this is they put it online on like a website like Zooniverse, uh, where people have like transcribed the laws of ships or annotated galaxies. Have there been any thoughts to trying to do a similar design? crowdsource? Yeah. Um, I, I guess because I'm just gonna say, in my experience, you'll be surprised that when you f put it out to the world, you get people who are really, really into learning something. So in the case of like transcribing naval logs, they do this to recover like what the weather was like in the 1800s. And you can find a community of people who really like ships and will do lots of yeah. really detailed yeah. work for you because of that. It's, it's sort of a, a dream of mine to uh, pull off something like this. And as far as I know, there hasn't been anything like it. Now, there's not the same sort of data set as these you know, mm. ships logs with the beautiful cursive handwriting, et cetera. But, um, I think, framed the right way, medical students should be interested in this kind of information. Right. And I, I think you know, it could be something gamified. It could be something fun for people as part of their training to really look through some of this stuff. Yeah, or more accurately, people who, don't have ac who have an interest in medicine and don't have access to the traditional resources that we think about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the, so the closest thing that we've been working on is actually pushing it onto the interviewers. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a person yeah. who's listening to each one of these uh, stories in the verbal autopsy case, and who's, you know, in the traditional way, writing down with pencil and paper all of the things that the person is saying about the, what happened in the death. Yeah. And one place to do it is just to push down to them some structured data extraction then have a checkbox and say, did they say malaria when they were talking about what happened? You know, that would be really useful to know in a structured way. Did they say fever? That's fascinating stuff where we ask about fever. I think that was one of the questions I showed. But if someone volunteers fever as part of their, you know, kind of open narrative about what happened, it's much more meaningful than if they say, yeah, they had a fever when you ask about it. You talked a lot about the uncertainties in the estimates and that you could drill down and see those and stuff, but you're still kind of fundamentally 
presenting this really high dimensional point estimate of a tree map? And have you guys looked at like how that influences you know decision makers and are there better ways to show them this summary that maybe aren't quite as certain? I would love to dig into that kind of stuff. And I think it's very hard to, to get the people who really are going to make decisions based on this to sit down and tell you like what they think about how you're showing it. So we tried. I, I, I work with a guy who kind of first started making tree maps of this stuff. And uh, he was a student when he started doing it so I could make him do lots of stuff. And I said, come on, how can we show uncertainty? Let's try color. No, that was terrible. Let's try like radio static, like a, a animation over it where it's got more different colors moving around depending on how certain it is. Didn't really work. So, so far there's nothing that I think looking at it is going to do a good job. But even if I found something that I thought was good, then there's the question of like, is the Minister of Health of Rwanda going to be into it? And I don't know if she'll sit down and really like focus group it with me. I can imagine, relatively speaking, by like not trying to show all of the layers at once, right? For any given layer, you know, you can use a box plot or something, right? But yeah, and so hidden in here, there's a ton of different ways of looking at things. And some of them make it even less clear. Let me uh, show you at a slightly lower level. So this is the kind of thing that you know, my colleagues who are thinking about what they, they think their audience will be up for looking at, they say, it's got to be like really simple. <laughs> like There's some things that are red here and some solid lines, and you've got to worry about that. And that's the kind of thing that people are up for looking at. Um, but it's all about knowing your audience. Or here's another one that uh, takes a lot of the detail out of it, but puts it in a way that uh, it makes it like, you know, how uh, does Australia compare to these comparator countries? And if that's more exciting to people who are looking at things, maybe that gets them in more. Um, I'm showing you these just because I don't have a good answer, but th there's both a lot of thought about how to do it and not a lot of science about how to do it. The thought is very much at the like, I was inspired to show it this way. Are you doing any machine learning type things to try to tease out significant incidents of things that maybe your, hypo your human hypothetical analyses might not uncover? There's a lot of opportunity for that. And at this point, there's not very much machine learning going on. Um, so the, the closest thing that's really in use is for figuring out for the cause of death stuff if there's uh, predictive covariance. And there, I mean, you know, it's like basically using linear regression <laughs> as its central method. But then what do you put as the d uh, independent variables in the regression? So they're using some randomness to try different things and using ensembles to say, okay, here's a, a kind of an ensemble of different uh, sets of predictors that seems reasonable. I think, I think my concern with this is not just the overspecificity, but the fact that, that you're maybe coming up with, with these numbers and presentations based on all these, all these assumptions you've built in already, and what, it, and what if you calculated with sort of no assumptions would it come out? Yeah, so that the, the other side of the spectrum is to say, you know, let us start with as few assumptions as possible and just go, you know, kind of uh, uh, item by item. What do we know and how sure are we of it and what comes out? To, to the degree, a different grad student who was uh, good friends with the guy who started the tree maps really was inspired by like a, a kind of metric approaches that use these minimal assumptions. Um, and pushed it a little bit, basically said, we don't, but we don't get anything. <laughs> We're sure that the prevalence is between 0 and 100%. Um, oh, I, I really like to be right, so I'm glad that we can be sure of that, but it didn't take a lot of effort to get to that point. Yeah. I guess, um, like, how do you know when you're doing a good job? Like, I, I, are you, like, 
this is awesome and you present to Bill Gates and he gives you lots of money or are you like going to publications and hoping to get into this uh, and try to satisfy reviewers like or is it internal like how do you guys even think about that I mean the thing I love about global health is that people care about this stuff so it's a good job if it works you know and if it improves health and we're rather distal we're not like building a clinic and staffing it and can say how much uh, health care did we deliver? We're saying we've done all of this measurement and we think it's important. And then I didn't talk about the E in IHME, but in evaluations, mm -hmm. we want to say, well, we tried to do this thing and here's how much it costs. It's easy to see from uh, the expenditure side of things, but how much health did it do? What kind of change did it make? Yeah. And it takes some time to have an answer when the thing you're producing is information. I guess I was just going to comment that I think a lot of our concerns that we're asking about are relatively academic in comparison to like the importance of what you're doing. So I'm happy to accept a slightly too large error bar and if it improves global health. You know. But the, the fundamental questions are, will people use error bars? <laughs> should, should I show the error? I mean, I've, I've had like arguments yeah. with people in uh, government who are saying, you mean you want me to say between 20 and 40 people died of malaria? That's exactly what I meant. I mean, you're making fun of me, but you understand it now. Yeah, because we don't know that it was 32 people, so you, you can't be that precise. But again, maybe that's me being an academic where this guy who is about to go talk to his boss about funding allocation or something knows what is needed for that situation. Okay, so. Well, thanks so much. That's it.